Alrighty, welcome. So I am continuing this lecture series in, in addition to the one on market capture, I'm also doing this one on ichthyology. Ichthyology, of course, we're going to talk a little bit about this, but this is really about studying fish. Uh, and what you can see down at the bottom, just to give you an idea about some of the stuff that we're going to talk about, it, is the diversity of just some darters um, in the United States. These are all clearly related to one another, uh, but they're all actually different species, and these are all um, male darters uh, with different coloration. So let's move forward and look at what we're going to go through in this. So before I uh, claim all of this as my own, obviously it, this course is built from a backbone and, and the backbone is derived from uh, these uh, textbooks. So the diversity of fishes, uh, which is done by Healthman uh, at Al, is, is an excellent uh, book for uh, introduction to ichthyology, although it doesn't say it directly on the cover. Uh, and then, of course, Fish is an Introduction to Ichthyology by Moyle and Check uh, is also a very good book for uh, study intro to uh, ichthyology as a general topic. Both of these books have a number of different editions. I'll just tell you that the different editions are not terribly important other than to say that if you want to really understand the evolution of fishes, then you will need the most recent edition because the evolution of fishes is constantly being updated. So having an older version will prevent you from really understanding what we know about the evolution of fishes currently. However, many of the other things are probably pretty straightforward and haven't changed that much. We're learning more and more about how fishes move within the environment and what that actually means. Uh, but we're not necessarily learning uh, some of the fundamental, that there are fundamental flaws in our understanding of some of the basic things like what we'll talk about in the future. Uh, gas bladders and uh, scales, for instance, would be uh, w well established in what they do and, and why they exist. So in any introduction book, you'll get that kind of information. So if you're looking to pick up uh, a book or two books to look through this topic, I would certainly recommend either one of these or both of these books. Uh, and again, you don't necessarily even need to to uh, buy these books, uh, but you can, you can find these frequently in libraries because they're well used. So what is ichthyology? Ichthyology, of course, is the study of fishes. That's why people uh, are interested in it. Uh, it, of course, includes many, many other branches of biology now. There are many branches of biology that deal with fish and uh, fish ecology. Uh, those all fall under, in some way, the study of ichthyology, which is really the, the parent uh, branch of biology which drove this. One thing that we should get out of the way initially right now is the use of the word fish and fishes. You may have heard in the past that the word fishes is not correct. Fishes is certainly correct, but only under a specific way. Uh, fish is used in a singular plural, but it only refers in that case to a single species. So all the fish on the left, uh, you would refer to the individuals as either a fish or many fish. But if there were multiple species within the group on, on the picture on the left, then you would call them fishes when you referred to the plural. You would still say, look at that fish if you're referring to an individual. But if you were talking about the group and there was multiple species, you would say, look at all of those fishes. One thing I think that we also have to establish right now is what is a fish. I think a lot of people... Uh, have some very clear definitions in their mind that seem to work well, but I'll just ask you to think for a moment here, what makes a fish a fish? A lot of people are concerned with things like what covers the body, uh, where the what they actually look like, uh, how they behave, um, and of course where they live. One of the important points, of course, with using of the word fish actually uh, is that we have largely two different definitions for it. In one sense, we have the traditional uh, definition of a fish based on an animal that lives in water. And that includes even animals that are clearly not very closely related. So for instance, jellyfish, uh, as you can see up here in the top corner, are referred to uh, from a traditional sense as a fish because they live in water. But of course, they're not fish in the way that we think of them. Uh, on the other hand, we look at animals like amphibians and birds, and we say, well, those are clearly not fish. Uh, and then we look at things like sharks, and we say, well, sharks are probably fish, and things like uh, eels look like 
fish and things like lampreys are kind of fish. I don't know that they're really fish, but they might be something like a fish. And then, of course, we look at things like bass and we say, oh, that's a very clearly defined fish. But we need to actually establish is what a fish is. So let's talk about the tree of fish. In this case, I'm going to show you the tree of uh, vertebrates in this case. So what you're looking at here is actually an, a tree of relatedness of individuals to one another. So we always start here at the very bottom. This is the base of the tree. This is the original common ancestor. And what you can see there is uh, that there are two groups here uh, that come off very soon. These are the hemichordata and the echinodermata. Hemichordatas are probably something you've never seen before. They're acorn worms. They're fairly unusual. They're not that many species. Uh, they're pretty weird looking animals. The Echinodermata, you probably have seen before. Uh, those are, of course, sea stars. Uh, urchins also fall into that. Uh, sea lilies um, and sea cucumbers actually all fall under that grouping. Those, are, of course, we do not generally consider them fish, and, and for a variety of different reasons, they very. I've never heard anyone call them a fish before. Cephalochordata is a rare group of animals that look something like a larval fish. These are the lancelets. Uh, they are fairly unusual. We don't run into them very frequently. They're in marine sediments and they filter feed. They look something like a fish in that they have a sort of long linear body, but they have a number of characteristics that makes them very unfish-like. Tunicata are a group of animals that are called tunicates, which are, are also called sea squirts. They function like a sponge. They sit on the bottom and filter water. But their larval stage, which is shown here, uh, acts very much like a larval fish and swims around in the water column. And now we start to move into animals that look a lot like fish. And this is the point. These question marks mean we don't understand necessarily the relatedness of these groups to one another. And in fact, uh, in most recent work, these two groups here, where the question marks are positioned, are actually one in the same group. They're no longer split like this. In any case, uh, what we generally come to right away after that is hagfish, which we some people will call fish, and then the lampreys. This group, the anapsidae, anapsidae are um, an extinct group of jawless fish without armor. Uh, there are some members within the uh, fossil record, not very many, unfortunately, because they don't have armor. But of course, these are generally considered fish, the lampreys and the hagfish. And that's because all vertebrates are considered fish. So any vertebrate is a fish by definition. Now, there are plenty of vertebrates that we consider very special and we treat a well away from ichthyology. But what you'll actually see here is uh, where I'm going to show you from here all the way out to here, uh, all of these animals are now extinct. And these are all considered fish in some sense. Animals over here, however, are still present uh, in the in modern uh, fish assemblages. And then animals over here are still present in modern fish assemblages. Now, what's interesting to note here, these are all the uh, lineages of fish. And what you'll see actually is that within those lineages of fish, there's a special group called the tetrapods. And the tetrapods are actually all vertebrates uh, that you think of when you think of things like amphibians and mammals and birds um, are actually a derived group of fish which fall in this grouping the tetrapodomorpha. So actually when we define fish we're really talking about vertebrates. However that's sort of an unwieldy definition because uh, terrestrial vertebrates live a very different life from aquatic invertebrates and so terrestrial vertebrates are actually split away from aquatic uh, vertebrates and treated differently and those groupings actually get their own branches of of study usually in their own entry level uh, courses associated with them. For instance, if you're interested in birds, although birds are a very derived group of fish, they would still be called, that would still get its own group, that would be called um, ornithology. Or if you're very interested in mammals, that would be mammalology. Um, there's a lot of pieces of studying of various groups that falls under tetrapods and they're split out artificially but they, I just want you to keep in mind that they actually do have relatedness to fish in that sense. So the group that gave rise to the tetrapods is actually this group of fish, the Sarcopterygians, which are the lobe fin fish. This is a coelacanth. This is a very classic example of this group. And we're going to talk more about this when we talk about the origins of fish. What you can see here is that most people would identify this as a fish very clearly. And some things that people like to identify with fish that are present in many fish species are things like uh, gills um, that, that extract oxygen from water. 
uh, as well as scales. Scales are also very common within fish. And then uh, fins are, are fairly frequent and common occurrence. And things like a very clear head uh, and animals that live in water is, one of the, again, one of those characteristics that, that uh, we use to define fish. This is another Sarcopterygian. This is the lungfish. Uh, you can see it's a very different Sarcopterygian, but this is actually a very close relative of all other tetrapods. And what you can see the lungfish is already um, established within that body plan is, is it's moved on to only four limbs, and that will carry through for the rest of, ev of our uh, evolution of tetrapods. So that will be all further tetrapods will be defined by having only four limbs. And here you can see, at least in this group of fish, it's already established. And then this is actually an extinct Sarcopterygian, which uh, now we call an amphibian. Uh, but you can see that this is a very fish-like tetrapod. It's got lots of fingers and toes, which look a lot like fin rays. Uh, it may have had some scales. It has what we're going to talk about in the future, which is the lateral line, uh, which is used for detecting uh, water movements underwater. Uh, and this animal also clearly does not have a very strong pelvis or forearm, so it's not really crawling around a lot. So this is probably an animal that spends almost all of its time or all of its time in the water on this very large tail. So again, although this is traditionally broken away from ichthyology in a more uh, balanced way, it should be included within the branch of ichthyology, but it's very difficult to talk about so many different groups of organisms at once. So we usually remove all tetrapods from the study of ichthyology just for convenience, not for an actual, uh, not for any, not any reason based on uh, evolution. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about the range and size of fishes as well. So of course, one of the largest current fish, if we're including sharks within the fish right now, uh, would certainly be the whale shark, and the whale shark at about 12 meters. It's an enormous animal. Uh, again, it is, it is the current largest fish, and it probably is one of the largest fish that's ever lived. It seems that about 12 meters is, is uh, approaching some maximum size for most fishes, at least based on our fossil records. We also have, down here at the bottom, we have what is currently the smallest known fish. This may change in the future, but it's pretty hard to get smaller than this. This animal is only 7.9 millimeters when it's fully grown, and at that point it starts to reproduce. So this is effectively a larval fish that starts to reproduce. So what percentage of our fish are actually fish? What percentage of the animals that we're actually going to look at are we... Are, are what percentage of vertebrates are we actually going to look at in this course? Well, one of the groups I haven't mentioned yet, which is the largest, is the Osteichthyes, that's a bony fish. That encompasses more than 50% of all known vertebrate species. Uh, and then the other group that's relatively large within the group fish is the Chondrichthyes, and that's about 2%, so it's a relatively small. This will be your sharks and rays. Everything else, again, remember, is still a vertebrate lineage, so by Technical definition, it is a fish, but usually it's split out in this format where we treat mammals different from amphibians, different from reptiles, different from aves, which is birds. Uh, as a quick note here about pie charts and just how to present things, if you can avoid it, never, always do uh, avoid pie charts. I'm just going to show you an example um, of a pie chart here just so I can make that point. Pie charts are very difficult to discern with the eye what percentage is making up one, what slice of the pie. And so whenever possible, don't use pie charts. Uh, they're also very space consumptive in that you can't get a lot of things around these curved edges because things don't fit well into those areas. Uh, and they tend to, to consume a lot of the space within the presentation for something that's not particularly uh, informative in that sense. Something that's far more effective would be something like a bar chart like this. And here I've used it to fill out all of the space within a chart. You can easily see the different heights of the bars. And even more important for scientists especially is we can put error bars around these so we can put we can show some uncertainty. You may say, well, how would you have error around what percentage of species are in each grouping? Well, of course you'll have error around that because we don't know the exact number of species within each grouping. So we could put some small error bars around here reflective of, of how uncertain we are about how many species of these different groups there are out there. I'd like to point out here that people think a lot about how important mammals are. Mammals are certainly very, very important animals. But just keep in mind how, how much more abundant birds are relative even to mammals. And then, of course, how... how uh, uh, low in diversity birds are compared to just osteichthyes. This is, this is one very large group of, of other 
So, and this is, I would say, the most efficient use of space where you combine everything into a single bar uh, and then you can rapidly discern with your eye the different groupings. Again, these are all just different ways to try to present data uh, and there are ways to try to do it in the most efficient way uh, it possible within presentations. This is relatively important, especially if you're dealing with trying to, to show off what you know or to tell people something new that they might not know that they're interested in. Okay, now let's actually get back to ichthyology. So if we break up the groups of fish into what here uh, is different groupings within these groups, traditional groups of fish. Okay, so I've removed mammals, I've removed reptiles, I've removed birds. Um, what I have here are what we consider, quote, fish, right? These are animals that live in the water. Uh, and that's, I would say, these are vertebrates that live exclusively in water that don't belong to amphibians. That's the best way that we can define fish because we're making these sort of artificial uh, groupings for them. Up at the top here, we have our most primitive groups, uh, the mixiniformes and the petromyzontiformes. These would be our jawless fish. We'll talk more about them in the future. Uh, the, I study the petromyzontiformes, and you can see there's relatively few species. As you move down, you can see some of these different groups have lots of species. Cyprinoformes are minnows. You can see this very large bar here for uh, minnows. Uh, but actually, the largest bar is dominated by what are called percoformes. Percoformy is actually, uh, if you look at this bar here, it actually extends well off the chart. It's actually three times as long as this chart, but that would dwarf all these bars so you wouldn't be able to see them. It would just look like one giant long bar and then a bunch of tiny little bars or no bars at all. You can see here that there are actually so, these have so few species um, that you can't even detect those on here. And I'm sorry, I didn't label the axi down here. Uh, this is actually the number of species within the group. So currently the most uh, speciose group would be our percoformes. So where do we find fish? So of course when you look at the water on the surface of the earth most everything is salt water. Uh, that's, that's true uh, in every case. If you go out to space it's very obvious that the vast majority of water is stored as salt water and if you look at photos of the earth you'll see that most water is, is salt water. You can usually ignore fresh water as a, a result but actually, freshwater holds a, a number of species. We're going to talk about that. But what you can see on the right here is the percentage of salt water on our planet. So it's almost entirely salt water. And then the percentage of freshwater. And this has probably been true for a long time. Salt water has probably been uh, the dominant form of, of available water on the planet for uh, many, many, many millions of years. So remember, freshwater here, I've broken it up, actually. Freshwater is actually composed of a couple different things. There are lakes and rivers, uh, which is so small you can almost not see that bar. There is groundwater, which is far more common, and this is what people tend to pump if they, are, uh, if they have a well. And then, actually, the most abundant form of freshwater is glaciers and snow. So uh, this is one of the reasons it's so important to understand how fast ice is melting in the Arctic because of global warming, because glaciers and snow compose a significant portion of the amount of the remaining water on Earth that is not salt water. And so if you add this little slice on top of here, you get enormous changes in the height of water uh, in, the, in the ocean. But in general, what we're concerned with, there are very few fish, if any, that live in groundwater. Um, and there are really no fish that live in glaciers, right? So we don't really see fish swimming around in glaciers. All the other freshwater fish we think of live in this tiny little bar down here. And then all the other marine fish live in this giant blue bar over here. So what percentage of species are in saltwater and what percentage are in freshwater? And what you actually find is that it's, it's far more equal than the diversity of uh, the, the breakup of water would suggest. And it also suggests that freshwater systems are far, 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 far more diverse than saltwater systems in general. Uh, you can take very species poor freshwater systems. You can find those. That's not necessarily difficult. For instance, if you go very far into the Arctic, you may only have 10 or 12 or 14 or, or 20 species within a, a stream. Whereas if you go to a coral reef, you may find hundreds or thousands of species in a very small area. But in general, the overall percentage of species still favors freshwater species based on the amount of territory, right? There are still, by area, far more freshwater fish per area than in saltwater. So what's actually going on here? 
Well, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but this has a lot to do with how speciation occurs and how populations of animals get segregated from one another and their genes start to diverge from each other and become different species. And freshwater systems really offer that opportunity. There's a lot of opportunities for fish to get locked out from other populations, to evolve and pick up different genes or to, to modify different genes, and then when they recombine later, uh, to not be able to interbreed and be good species. We're in saltwater systems, there's far more movement back and forth between different populations, and it's harder to segregate populations from each other, and so speciation there tends to be a little bit lower. In addition, most of the salt water is like a desert. There's lots of water there, but there's not much there to eat. So if you go into the open ocean, the number of animals actually living out in the open ocean is very, 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 very low. Uh, there's not much out there to consume, and so the animals that are actually out there are fairly rare, and they tend to be pretty migratory. So in those cases, think of big tuna. Big tuna are big, and they're impressive in that sense, but they cover vast amounts of area to consume food. They do not remain in one area, and as a result, the actual biomass per area is relatively low. And so if you have relatively few animals already, and they migrate a lot, those are really poor conditions for speciation. What you really want is lots of small animals packed into areas that can easily get cut off from one another and do that relatively often to get uh, lots of speciation. Uh, and then what you can't see with these bar charts is they don't quite sum to 100%. They sum to just a little bit less. And the little bit less is associated with fishes that actually move between freshwater and saltwater and that sort of sit at the bridge. So those are estuarine fish. Uh, you can think of animals that live in mangrove swamps tend to be able to live in both freshwater and saltwater. Uh, and those are, those are animals that are not bound to one or the other. They tend to live right on the fringe. But they make up a relatively small proportion of overall fish diversity. Again, we can almost ignore them as a matter of fact uh, when we talk about the diversity of fishes. Okay, so where we're going to go, I'm going to actually start this course by really talking about the evolution of fish because I think it's really un important to understand how we got the groups that we did and what they actually do and why they look different and why also they look similar. So there are clearly uh, similarities between groups, but there's also clearly uh, very great differences between groups. So we're going to talk about that uh, before we proceed on. So I just want you to leave you with this view of the tree of fish life. Uh, and a little bit extra down here. Uh, and we'll come back to it and really deal with these groups one at a time. So we'll start with the more primitive groups and we'll advance into more uh, uh, advanced and, and more what we call derived groups and really talk about those in the future.